ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4, Chapter 21, Text 27. Translation. My dear respectable ladies and gentlemen, according to the authoritative statements of Shastra, there must be a supreme authority who is able to award the respective benefits of our present activities. Otherwise, why should there be persons who are unusually beautiful and powerful, both in this life and in the life after death? Purport, Prithu Maharaj's sole aim in ruling his kingdom was to raise the citizens to the standard of God consciousness. Since there was a great assembly in the arena of sacrifice, there were different types of men present, but he was especially interested in speaking to those who were not atheists. It has already been explained in the previous verses that Prithu Maharaj has advised the citizens to become adhokshaja dhyaha, which means God conscious or Krishna conscious. And in this verse, he specifically presents the authority of Shastra, even though his father was a number one atheist who did not abide by the injunctions mentioned in the Vedic Shastras, who practically stopped all sacrificial performances, and who so disgusted the Brahmanas that they not only dethroned him, but cursed and killed him. Atheistic men do not believe in the existence of God, and thus they understand everything which is happening in our daily affairs to be due to physical arrangement and chance. Atheists believe in the atheistic Sankhya philosophy of the combination of Prakriti and Purush. They believe only in matter and hold that matter under certain conditions of amalgamation give rise to the living force, which then appears as Purush, the enjoyer. Then, by a combination of matter and the living force, the many varieties of material manifestation come into existence. Nor do atheists believe in the injunctions of the Vedas. According to them, all the Vedic injunctions are simply theories that have no practical application in life. Taking all this into consideration, Prithu Maharaj suggested that theistic men will solidly reject the views of the atheists on the grounds that there cannot be many varieties of existence without the plan of a superior intelligence. Atheists very vaguely explain that these varieties of existence occur simply by chance, but the theists who believe in the injunctions of the Vedas must reach all their conclusions under the direction of the Vedas. In the Vishnu Purana, it is said that the entire Varnashram institution is meant to satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The rules and regulations set up for the execution of the duties of Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shudras or Brahmacharis, Grihasthas, Vanaprastas and Sannyasis are meant to satisfy the Supreme Lord. At the present moment, although the so-called Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shudras have lost their original culture, they claim to be Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shudras by birthright. Yet they have rejected the proposition that such social and spiritual orders are especially meant for worship of Lord Vishnu. The dangerous Mayavad theory set forth by Shankara Acharya that God is impersonal does not tally with the injunctions of the Vedas. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu therefore described the Mayavadi philosophers as the greatest offenders against the personality of Godhead. According to the Vedic system, one who does not abide by the orders of the Vedas is called a Gnostic or atheist. When Lord Buddha preached his theory of non-violence, he was obliged to deny the authority of the Vedas, and for this reason he was considered by the followers of the Vedas to be a Gnostic. But although Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu very clearly enunciated that the followers of Lord Buddha's philosophy are Gnosticas or atheists because of their denial of the authority of the Vedas, he considered the Shankarites who wanted to establish Vedic authority by trickery and who actually followed the Mayavad philosophy of Buddha's school to be more dangerous than the Buddhists themselves. 
The Shankarite philosopher's theory that we have to imagine a shape of God is more dangerous than denial of the existence of God. Notwithstanding all the philosophical theorizing by atheists or mayavadis, the followers of Krishna consciousness rigidly live according to the injunctions given in Bhagavad Gita, which is accepted as the essence of all Vedic scripture. In Bhagavad Gita it is said, Yataf pravritir bhutanam yena sarvam medantatam svakarmana tamabhyacha siddhin vindati manavaha By worship of the Lord who is the source of all beings, and who is all-pervading, man can, in the performance of his own duty, attain perfection. This indicates that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the original source of everything as described in the Vedanta Sutra. Janmadhyasya yataha. The Lord himself also confirms in Bhagavad Gita, Ahang saravasya prabhavaha. I am the origin of everything. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is the original source of all emanations, and at the same time, as Paramatma, he is spread all over existence. The Absolute Truth is therefore the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and every living being is meant to satisfy the Supreme Godhead by performing his respective duty, Swakaramana Atama Maharaj Prithu wanted to introduce this formula among his citizens. The most important point in human civilization is that while one engages in different occupational duties, he must try to satisfy the Supreme Lord by the execution of such duties. That is the highest perfection of life. Svanushthitasya dharmasya sangsidhir harito shanam By discharging one's prescribed duty, one can become very successful in life if he simply satisfies the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The vivid example is Arjuna. He was a kshatriya. His duty was to fight, and by executing his prescribed duty, he satisfied the Supreme Lord and therefore became perfect. Everyone should follow this principle. The atheists who do not are condemned in Bhagavad Gita by the following statement. In this verse, it is clearly said that persons who are envious of the Supreme Personality of Godhead are the lowest of mankind and are very mischievous. Under the regulated principles of the Supreme, such mischievous persons are thrown into the darkest region of material existence and are born of asuras or atheists. Birth after birth, such asuras go still further down, finally to animal forms like those of tigers or similar ferocious beasts. Thus, for millions of years, they have to remain in darkness without knowledge of Krishna. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is known as Purushottam, or the best of all living entities. He is a person like all other living entities, but he is the leader or the best of all living beings. That is stated in the Vedas also. Nityo nityanam chetanash chetananam He is the chief of all eternals, the chief of all living entities, and he is complete and full. <coughs> He has no need to derive benefit by interfering with the affairs of other living entities, but because he is the maintainer of all, he has the right to bring them to the proper standard so that all living entities may become happy. A father wants all of his children to become happy under his direction. Similarly, God or Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, has the right to see that all living entities are happy. There is no possibility of becoming happy within this material world. The father and the sons are eternal. But if a living entity does not come to the platform of his eternal life of bliss and knowledge, there is no question of happiness. Although Purushottama, the best of all living entities, has no benefit to derive from the common living entities, he does have the right to discriminate between their right and wrong ways. The right way is the path of activities meant to satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead, as we have already discussed. Svanushthitasya dharmasya sangsidhir harito shanam. A living entity may engage in any occupational duty, but if, he, but if he wants to have perfection in his duties, he must satisfy the Supreme Lord. As such, one who pleases him gets better facilities for living, but one who displeases him gets involved in undesirable situations. 
It is therefore concluded that there are two kinds of duties, mundane duty and duty performed for the sake of yagya or sacrifice. Yagyarthat karma no Yagyarthat karma. Any karma activity one performs which is not for the purpose of yagya is a cause of bondage. Yagyarthat karma no nyatra loko yang karma bandhanaha. Work done as a sacrifice for Vishnu has to be performed, otherwise work binds one to this material world. Karma bandhanaha, or the bondage of karma, is administered under the regulations of the stringent laws of material nature. Material ex existence is a struggle to conquer the impediments put forth by material nature. The asuras are always fighting to overcome these impediments, and by the illusory power of material nature, the foolish living entities work very hard within this material world and take this to be happiness. This is called Maya. In that hard struggle for existence, they deny the existence of the Supreme Authority, Purushottam, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In order to regulate the activities of the living entities, God has given us codes, just as a king give, gives codes of law in a state, and whoever breaks the law is punished. Similarly, the Lord has given the infallible knowledge of the Vedas, which are not contaminated by the four defects of human life, namely, the tendency to commit mistakes, to be illusioned, to cheat, and to have imperfect senses. If we do not take direction from the Vedas, but act, act whimsically according to our own choice, we are sure to be punished by the laws of God, who offers different types of bodies in the 84 lakh species of forms. Material existence or the sense gratification process is conducted according to the type of body we are given by prakriti, or material nature. As such, there must be divisions of pious and impious activities, punya and pa. In Bhagavad Gita, it is clearly stated, yeshang tvantakatang papang jananang punya karmanam te dvandamohanir mukta bhajante mang jadabrataha. One who has completely surpassed the resultant activities of the impious path of life. This is possible only when one engages exclusively in pious activities. Can understand his eternal relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Thus one engages in the Lord's transcendental loving service. This life of engaging always in the loving service of the Lord is called Adhoksha Jadhyaha, or a life of Krishna consciousness, which King Prithu meant his citizens to follow. The different varieties of life and of material existence do not come about by chance and necessity. They are different arrangements made by the Supreme Lord in terms of the pious and impious activities of the living entities. By performing pious activities, one can take birth in a good family, in a good nation, one can get a beautiful body, or can become very well educated or very rich. We, therefore, we see therefore that in different places and in different planets, there are different standards of life, bodily features and educational statuses, all awarded by the Supreme Personality of Godhead according to pious or impious activities. Varieties of life, therefore, develop not by chance but by prearrangement. There is a plan which is already outlined in the Vedic knowledge. One has to take advantage of this knowledge and mold his life in such a way that at the end, especially in the human form of life, he may go back home, back to Godhead, by practicing Krishna consciousness. The theory of chance can best be explained in the Vedic literature by the words Agyata Sukriti, which refer to pious activities performed without the actor's knowledge. But these are also planned. For example, Krishna comes like an ordinary human being. He comes as a devotee like Lord Chaitanya. Or he sends his representative, the spiritual master or pure devotee. This is also the planned activity of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They come to canvas and educate, and thus a person in the illusory energy of the Supreme Lord gets a chance to mix with them, talk with them, and take lessons from them. And somehow or other, if a conditioned soul surrenders to such personalities, and by intimate association with them chances to become Krishna conscious, he is saved from the material conditions of life. Krishna therefore instructs, Sarvadhaman Parittaja Mamekang Sharanam Raja Ahang Twang Sarva pape bhyo muksha yishami mahashuchaha. Abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender unto me. I shall deliver you from all sinful reaction. Do not fear. The word sarva pape bhyaha means from all sinful activities. 
A person who surrenders unto him by utilizing the chance to associate with the pure devotee, spiritual master, or other authorized incarnations of Godhead like Prithu Maharaj is saved by Krishna, then his life becomes successful. Srila Prabhupada has given a relatively long purport on this verse. I say relatively long because actually every verse of Bhagavatam could be dilated upon ad infinitum because it's infinite. The knowledge given in Bhagavatam is non-different from Krishna. Bhagavatam is non-different from Krishna. Krishna tula Bhagavat Vibhu Sarva Shrai Prati Shloke Prati Akare Nana Artha Khoi Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said that Bhagavatam is the same as Krishna. It's as powerful as Krishna. Like Krishna can give shelter to everyone. And in every word and in every syllable, there are so many different points to be understood. So, uh, Prabhupada's purport, we may think it's quite long, but it's, it's l- significantly longer than most of the purports he has given. But if we consider the subject matter, it's just an introduction. If we consider the subject matter of the verse, Prabhupada has given an extensive purport um, on this verse, which gives two pramans or sources of evidence for the fact of the existence of God. One is the the existence of God means God here defined as the supreme authority. One is given by the statements of Shastra. Another is by logical inference that uh, some persons uh, some persons are seen to be very beautiful and powerful. And that also means that some persons are not very beautiful, not very powerful. There are different gradations of life. So there must be some supreme authority who's giving someone a higher position, someone a lower position. So Prabhupada extensively discusses this in the verse, in the purport, that we, the the atheists say everything is simply by chance. But this is, as Prabhupada says, atheists very vaguely explain that these varieties of existence occur simply by chance very vaguely, because you can't explain very clearly something which isn't true. If you want to go into great detail uh, explaining how the capital of the United States is Detroit, it'd be very hard to find any... How could you explain in detail? Because there's no evidence. You just have to say very... You might try to invent some vague explanation because it's not true but uh, maybe if you wanted to mislead some some foolish person then or, or someone who is easily misled then we may someone may try to explain but he can't he can't take the person very philosophically deeply now we say, well, science has gone very deeply. The scientists who deny the existence of God. And I, I'm just reading a book on the on the history of science. So, uh, of course, we, from the history of science, we won't find Krishna. So you may think, well, why should I read it? Because uh, science, uh, Prabhupada wanted us to preach to rebut the theories of the scientists. So, as Prabhupada once explained, the first thing in fighting is to assess the position of the enemy. So, one, one, one self should be strong and know how to fight, but he has, also has to assess the position of the enemy. So, there were, 
there was a time in science when they believed that we'll be able to explain everything and we'll be able to demonstrate just like in an in the newsletter sent out to congregational members in Finland recently it was stated that uh, the descriptions of Bhagavatam of the atom have of course been refuted by modern science which is not true at all <laughs> because the scientists may have thought that they will establish we, we will be able to explain everything we'll be able to explain everything about what's going on in the world and then that will that will uh, negate the philosophical necessity for a belief in God and they may have been able to convince some foolish people just like this supposed devotee who wrote this bizarre statement <laughs> but uh, they may present that we know what we're talking about, but actually they don't. And their the scientists attempt to analyze and define reality in scientific terms is not possible. Recently I was speaking to a devotee who uh, did her PhD in atomic physics, and she said she was very impressed when she first went, to, she went first of all to a, a meeting of devotees and uh, Dev Amrit Maharaj was speaking. Now, he had been told that this atomic physicist, whoa, such a great personality is coming. So, uh, he said in the lecture that these scientists these atomic physicists, they don't know anything. And afterwards, the devotees said to him that, oh Maharaj, that was too heavy, you shouldn't have said that. But she was impressed because she thought, she told me, how does he know? <laughs> how does he know we don't know anything? He must know. Because they, they do a pretty good job of bluffing people in general that they know something. But Actually, they don't know anything. They have many theories which are, they, they make one hypothesis and that doesn't work so they invent something else to prop up that hypothesis and then someone else brings another hypothesis. And, and it, but it's all very impressive houses built on sand. There's no basis. They have, there's no actual basis. It means there's no, what they call scientific what they themselves would call scientific proof. There, I mean, of course, there, there are some things we can accept, just like if the scientist says, uh, gives us a statement like, two, if we bring two apples and bring another two apples, we get four apples. Okay, we can accept that. That's demonstrable. But if they, they're talking about the, uh, the nature of reality at the... If we say microscopic, that gives us the, uh, the microcosmic, that's it, microcosmic level, then they, they don't know. They have so many theories. And they, they, they find particles and then particles and 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 particles. And goes on. And then they say there are no particles anyway, they're just waves and so many funny things. And at the macrocosmic level, they also say so many things. Um, <laughs> just like I was reading yesterday, if, if the scientists say that this galaxy is uh, 50 billion light years away, that means that to the public they'll say, oh yes, yes, the scientists have said 50 billion light years away. But what it actually means is that they, they s suspect that it's somewhere between 20 and 120 billion light years away. <laughs> they don't know, they really don't know, for all the advancements. So people become unduly, persons who are foolish, they become unduly impressed by this, by this bluff, by this display of actual knowledge. So it's a very good exercise for all devotees who may be becoming enamored by these things to 
from time to time pick up this very good book called Life Comes from Life and read it. <laughs> and which Prabhupada cuts through. He, he plainly exposes all the, the bluffs of the scientists that, for instance, the, the post-dated check in future. So in future we shall create life. So Prabhupada, he immediately, this, this, is, this is amazing I, I, because this, this proposition was brought to Prabhupada and then immediately, immediately he gave the, the, the answer. Oh, post-dated check. That means that Krishna is speaking through him, obviously. So these, uh, these two evidences that there must be a supreme controller and you don't, you don't need a PhD to understand this. It's a very simple thing to understand. If you do have a PhD, it may be more difficult to understand it. Hare Krishna, Suswagatam. He also knows some Sanskrit. He studied at the university. So, uh, yeah, if one has a PhD, then it may be that uh, what happens, maya aparita jnana, that one has knowledge, but that maya aparita jnana means one who has knowledge, but that knowledge serves, that so-called knowledge serves to cover the actual knowledge. Actual knowledge is received, as stated here, from Shastra. From Shastra, and then again, uh, Prabhupada introduces in this purport the theories of the Sankhya philosophers, who say that there is Prakriti and Purusha, and it's just the interaction of these two. They use this uh, Andapangu Nyai, which Prabhupada used in a different way, the blind man and the lame man, that the blind man can't see, so he can't go anywhere, because if he goes anywhere, then the blind man, he falls into the ditch. He's, he can't go anywhere by, without help. And the pangu, or the crippled man, he also can't go. He can see where to go. The, the blind man is physically capable, but can't see where to go. And the lame man, is, he has, can see where to go, but he's physically incapable. So the two come together. Uh, the, the blind man uh, carries the lame man, on his shoulders, and the lame man gives directions, go here, go there, maybe indicate, push, touch on this side, touch on that side, like you do with a, with a bull when you're plowing. And then uh, the blind man who has physical strength can go. So the Sankhyaites use this, under Pangunyai, that Purush is like the uh, Layman, he has no power, but has intelligence. And Prakriti has, Prakriti means Shakti or energy, so Prakriti can move. <coughs> so when the two come together, then the whole cosmos goes on. So the Sankhya philosophy is also based on Veda Shastra, it's based on scripture. There are so many the, 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 Shad Darshan, the six Darshans, are all based on the Vedas. But they're all, with the exception of uh, Vedanta, the, the proper deliberation given by Vyasadev himself, who is the compiler of the Vedas. These are all useless. They're all because they don't, because they are based on incorrect deliberation on Shastra. So Shastra has to be accepted and with proper deliberation also proper understanding. Last night I was talking about how we have to receive the knowledge of Shastra in disciplic succession. But the, even that, that has to be with uh, proper understanding. Shravana, Manana, we have to, don't just, don't just hear. It's not a matter of hearing like a not a matter of just sitting, but one has to actually consider what is the, one has to consider what is the subject. One has to use the intelligence given by God to understand the subject matter. So here, Prithu Maharaj is 
stating that the supreme authority is to be accepted on the basis of Shastric statements and on the basis of logical deliberation also. Both things are required. And that logical deliberation, that has to be guided by those who are tatvavit, as Krishna, tatvavit, those who know what is the actual fact which is described in Shastra. And, or tatvadarshi, as Krishna explains also in Bhagavad Gita. One, one who has seen, one who has realized what are, the, um, what are the truths described in Shastra? So, uh, with this guidance and using one's own intelligence, one can understand. And actually, th- the basic point of the existence of God, th- that there must be some supreme authority, is not difficult to understand unless one's consciousness is, unless one is trained in atheism, as is what is actually going on in the educational system all over the world today. Even though they may pay lip service to God, uh, they give much more respect to Darwin's theory, which is, uh, of course, the Catholic Church has tried to incorporate incorporate Darwinism within their teachings. There's some idea that God pushed the button and then everything went on by remote control afterwards. But th- that, or, or that evolution, biological evolution, went on under the direction of God. Well, it's not exactly Darwin's theory, because he says the survival of the fittest. Incidentally, as a tangentially, if the survival of the fittest is to be accepted, then there was nothing wrong with Hitler. Because he said, we're German, we're strong, and to hell with the the Poles, the Ukrainians, the Russians, the Norwegians, the Danes, etc., the French, we're, we're stronger and we'll overrun them. So that should have been, oh, yes, very good. Might is right. So, uh, <clears throat> this idea that, there's, that God is there, but he's not the supreme authority, just like the, the famous rabbi Hari Krishna also wrote, wrote his book that... Uh, that why do bad things happen to good people? So he said, this is, a, this is a quandary. How can we understand this? Because if God is good, then only good things should happen to good people. And bad things shouldn't happen to good pe- people. So just like you see, there's a very nice young girl, 19 years old, very good, goes to church, prays to God, very pretty, and uh, one day... She's crossing the road and a truck hits her and the road is filled with pools of blood and in the newspaper the next day it said 19-year-old girl hit by truck and killed. So why do these things happen? So Hare Krishna brought the... Rabbi Hare Krishna brought the... brought the hypothesis that either God is all powerful but not very good because why should he do such things or he's all good but he kind of lost control of what's going on you know it's just like people they have their kids and when they're little you can control when they get older they're out of control so he, he lost control he had too many kids he wasn't doing family planning properly or something and uh, he ended up with all these wild people running all around and he means well. He's a good, he's a good old guy sitting up there somewhere, but he lost control. So we should still respect him because he's good and he's kind of powerful, but not all powerful. But this is actually is atheism. It's not theism. If you say you believe in God, but he's not all powerful, then then it's another form of atheism. Just like Prabhupada mentions in this purport about the. About the Mayavadis, they 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 believe in God. The, 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 the Sankhyaites they also speak of Ishvara. The, the Patanjala yogis they also speak of Ishvara, but but they are not accepted as theists, even though they speak of Ishvara, which is translated as controller or God. They are not actually considered theists because they don't accept what they what, how they define God. They don't accept him as the supreme, absolute, 
independent controller and enjoyer. They have their own, they have a definition of God who's just like uh, a vyavaharic God. Uh, what, how do we say that? A, a conventional or a, it means that he's a functional God. He has some kind of function to be God, but he's, he's not all powerful, all good, indep- independent, he's not absolute. So he has, he has some function in the cosmos, but he's, he's not all powerful. So it's a, I, I, it's like saying, uh, it's like saying, uh, let's think, I, I believe in, let's think, I, I believe in apples, but I don't believe they're a fruit. They're actually vegetables. Or they we, I believe in apple. Apple is a different kind of vegetable. But it's not. By biological definition, it's a fruit. So to say that means we don't really understand what we're talking about. And what we talk about as apples, it, it doesn't... Or I, I believe that an apple is a, is a, is a giant-sized vegetable that grows on the moon. Let's make it more absurd. So... Uh, so when we talk of apples, we say, I believe in apples. We say, oh, yeah, okay, all right. I also believe in apples. But what, what the real definition of apple is, and how someone else has defined it, that is somewhat something else. So if you say to that person who insists, it's a democratic country, I have all rights to believe that apples are giant vegetables that grow on the moon. So you can believe it if you like. So that person... If he, if he rejects, no, there's no such things as apples, which are uh, about this size fruits which grow on trees in America and other countries. So, if he, if he redefines, he takes the same word, redefines it, and doesn't accept the actual meaning of the word, then his belief in apples, or here we're talking about belief in God. It's not actually belief in God at all. So what goes on in the name of belief in God, a lot of it is, although people may say, yes, yes, I, I believe in God. Sometimes. But, but uh, it's not actually theism, because how can, we belie- how can we believe in anything unless we know what it is? It's, or e- that belief, it's, even if we have belief, it's not meaningful. It's a, it's a, it doesn't have meaning to believe in something if we, if we don't know what it is in any object or any phenomenon. So here, Prithu Maharaj is establishing the simple point that there must be a supreme authority. Supreme authority means in all matters, in all times, all places, all circumstances. That is the basic definition of, of God. That is, the, that is the definition of God that is suitable for persons in this material world. Actually, God is much more than that. God is not simply some uh, cosmic authority of, the, of, the, of this material world. It's a, this material world is like a prison. It's for the sinful persons or those who have gone against Krishna, those who have come away from Krishna. So it's, it's, if we consider that God is simply the authority who oversees the material world, uh, then, uh, if we think this is his prime function, he's created this material world, then that's like, uh, that's like ascribing to the emperor the position of a prison governor. It means we don't really understand his position. And this misunderstanding is compounded by the by the, mis- the the misunderstanding of the nature of god is compounded by the misunderstanding of thinking that this material world is a place of, for our enjoyment and that therefore god his function is to help us enjoy this material world and therefore we have hari krishna that not hari krishna hari krishna the rabbi so who who contends that, well, God's good, he's a nice guy, but he's lost control of this world, because if he was good, he would, uh, 
if he was if he was good and powerful then to the good people he would give them a happy life with lots of sense enjoyment and and trucks wouldn't run over and kill nice 19 year old girls it wouldn't happen so in other words he's uh, he's contending that satan is more powerful than god of course vedic philosophy which means exposition of reality doesn't exist doesn't accept the existence of any rival power to god who who is uh, almost uh, who's like harassing god who's doing a kind of a uh, brush war against god and and getting a few shots and you know sniping down some of his army like like running over the good the nice 19 year old oh that's the work of satan 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 is like a gorilla doing guerrilla warfare against God and he, he got a few points there. Eh, no such thing. Eh, Satan is invented as a theologicalness. It's just like the scientists. They invent all these wrong theories or speculative theories to, to try because they're, the theory that they made doesn't work. They found some evidence which contradicts it. So they have to make up something else to explain that. They have to tweak the theory a bit. So it's like that. It, they, they, they make up some Satan and, and then uh, in Catholic theology, at least when I was taught it at school, which is, may have changed since then, I don't know, but they, they were, we were taught that, uh, well, what about all those good Catholics who are, you know, who are sinful? They, they're Catholics, but they don't follow properly. So do they go to hell like the Protestants? And, and Protestants go to the worst hell. So, because uh, they don't believe in the Pope, it's the, the greatest crime. So, so all those Catholics who are like lying and stealing and cheating and drunkards and but they're Catholics, so they can't go to hell. I mean, you, you can't give them such a bad fate that they have to burn in hell side by side with the Protestants. So, okay, so they invented purgatory. No mention of it in the Bible, but. They invented purgatory, a place where you just go and burn for a little time and then you can go to heaven. Well, what about all those babies who are born of good Catholic parents and before they can be rushed off to the church and have some, uh, have some holy water thrown on them and they're baptized, they die. Well, they go to limbo. There's another major. So it's like that. They have to... If, if we don't have Bhagavad Tattva Vigyan, scientific knowledge of the Absolute Truth as, as given in Shastra, Bhagavata Shastra, then necessarily we come to the position of ignorance. So, that's what's going on in the name of religion. Priti vite jato katha dharma nama chale bhagavata kahitaha paripurna chale in the opinion of the Bhagavatam, everything that's going on in the name of religion in the world is just some different form of cheating. Because the so-called religions of the world are construed for the sense gratification of their followers with God as a kind of, God as some kind of vaguely defined guy in the sky who gives us blessings for our sense enjoyment. So, it's all cheating. It's, it's a, the so-called religions are a process of cheating people of actual knowledge of God. Misleading. So, it, we may say, well, it's religion, it's, it's better than being an atheist. It is to have some kind of belief in God. Some, maybe better. But unless we have actual knowledge then we're, we can't actually know him. And you can't actually love God if, without knowing him. Just like if I say that uh, you should love, you all love James Dykes. James Dykes. You all know James Dykes? You should love him, right? You should love everyone. You should love James Dykes. You should all love James Dykes. Well, who is he? We don't know who he is. So how can you love him? What is there to love about him anyway? 
So it's like that. If you say you should love God, but you don't know, you're just, you're just given the name, that's all. Okay, love him. That's the, uh, that's the protest in the, in the Western culture against arranged marriages. Well, how can you love someone if you don't know them? You don't love them. Until you, until you meet, after the marriage, then, then there's mixing and then it develops. That's all. And, and anyway, this idea of love, it's not promoted that, that you, this phantasmagorial idea of you love, you love your wife and then you go dancing in the, some, on the cinema screen, you suddenly get transported to a, a valley in Kashmir and there's a whole invisible orchestra and you start dancing. It's all, it's all ridiculous. There's, uh, there's some duty, is there? And by, by uh, co-jointly executing that duty, then naturally affection arises. But this idea that I found the, I found the person who is the, the real one for me, this is all nonsense, because the real one for us is Krishna. So this idea of loving the way, yeah, we love, but in relation to Krishna, that's all. Otherwise, that's maya. If we, if we love our wife or whatever, or we're, we're seeking for that love, any way we won't find if it's not in relationship to Krishna. Because no one can... No one can love, that love is meant for Krishna. And uh, it, it, it doesn't work because it's not real. The, the, the pure or full love can only be for Krishna. So this idea of you have to love your wife, yeah, love, yeah, okay, but on the basis of mutual service to Krishna, then naturally affection arises. So, uh, we have to know. When we know, and if someone actually has qualities, if we get to know them, then affection develops. So that's why, prior to marriage, in traditional culture, Vedic culture, the boy and girl, as they are called prior to marriage, they are trained. Boy is brahmachari, girl is trained how to be chaste, how to serve the husband, how to cook, all these things. So naturally, they're, they're trained in good qualities. They come together, they appreciate. And affection develops. But if you say you'll love, based on what? Based on uh, just, some, uh, just some phantasmagorial idea. I love your smile. Or your eyes. When I saw your eyes. Uh, it's, it's meaningless. It's, it's, that's maya. <laughs> so similarly, the idea that we shall love God but we have no information about Him and what does it come out to be? It comes out to be Maya. There's no basis. If we don't know anything about Him then how can we love Him? And so it, it, then it, it comes down to loving Mammon. In the name of loving God we love Mammon. We, we love our own sense gratification. So we didn't really make that much progress. The, the professed atheist Loves, he's dedicated to sense gratification. And the, the, even the professed theist who has no actual knowledge of God or, or how to satisfy him, then they must come to the platform of sense gratification because there's nowhere else for them to go. Except that they can say, I believe in God. And, and, and I believe in God and, and I, he will save me. Save you then, he'll save me, what does that mean? Save you from going to hell and then you go to heaven and then you'll go on with your sense gratification. That's their idea. That uh, God, he, we go to heaven, and then we go on, it's not really very clear, but there's the vague idea that we'll go on enjoying life, and uh, without, without the fear of going to hell, and without having to go to the office, or, or any such thing. So, they, they don't talk actually about what goes on in what they call heaven, or what is the nature of God. They, they hardly discuss such things. So it's, it's, it's very, very primary what goes on in the name of religion outside of Krishna consciousness. It's very, very primary. You're just seeing our role as enjoyer and God's role as the like a big brother enjoyer or something like that. So really the uh, Bhagavatam gives us knowledge of God which cannot be not comparable with any any scriptures in the world. Not comparable. 
we may take it for granted because we've had entrance to this but for, for some time. But actually the, the, the vital knowledge given in Bhagavata, vital, vital for all, vital for every individual, this knowledge that we, we need to understand who is God. Even the word God, it's, it's actually not very suitable for Krishna. Because Prabhupada used to say, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because he's so much more, the concept of God, just like Prabhupada in the, the first words of the Bhagavatam, in the introduction says, the concept of God and the concept of the Absolute Truth are not on the same level. What people think of God, they don't think of the Absolute Truth. So, but even Absolute Truth, Krishna's, he is the Absolute Truth, but, uh, but that it's, it, the Absolute Truth is not simply some principle. So really, the, 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 the Krishna, he's not very definable because he's beyond anything that we can think. He's, by, by definition, he's beyond de- definition. The only definition we can give of Krishna is that he's beyond definition. But we can... There are so many names which describe facets of his position. Asamurdhva means no one is he of whom there is no one equal or greater. Aprameya, he who is immeasurable. Achintya, he who is inconceivable. And at the same time, he is Yashoda Nanda, sucking the breast of Mother Yashoda. Who is to, who can understand this? It's, it's not understandable by logic, by, by, uh, applying our intelligence to uh, scriptural understandings, scriptural statements, we can understand that there is supreme authority who we should submit to for our own benefit. But what is his nature? What is the nature of that person? That we can also understand from scripture. But his personality, uh, his position is understandable to some extent, by application of intelligence, but his personality is not. Why? Why does Krishna like to play a flute? Well, we can say because he's keeping cows, and cows respond to flutes. And that's you'll find even now in India. So they, they go cow herding with flutes. So, but then why is he keeping cows? Even Brahma was bewildered. Why cow? You know, what's this? You know, uh, I'm born of Narayana, Brahma was thinking. And here's, here's this Krishna. I thought he was Narayana, but he's herding cows. And I'm, a, I'm Brahma. I'm the, I'm the uh, Adi Kavi, the first philosopher, Brahmana. And he's, he's just this little boy running around with cows, with, with vaishas. He doesn't even have any shoes on. So, <laughs> how is this God? He was bewildered. Muhyanti yat suryaha. Even the great demigods are bewildered. Krishna is not predictable. But we can say, we can, we can say, he is all powerful, he is independent, he is all loving, he is all kind. Uh, how this is practically demonstrated, we have to see. What is Krishna Leela? How how he is all powerful. The sun set. Arjuna said, if the sun sets, if I don't kill Jarah Sandha before the sun sets, then I will enter into fire. The sun set. And everyone thought, oh, now Arjuna is finished. Then Krishna said, hey, look, it's not set yet. And it come back up again. Krishna can do. Now that doesn't sound very possible even, because that would disturb the whole... Uh, Cause the, the whole solar system and uh, everything would get disturbed if the sun's movement changed. But Krishna can do it. And if we don't accept, oh, that's, that's not theism. So Krishna can do whatever he likes. And he does everything that he likes for the pleasure of his devotees. So it's a very deep topic. Uh, the the Bhagavad Tattva Vigyana to understand the science of God. The beginning is to accept that he is the supreme authority, but there's so much more to be understood.
Therefore, Prabhupada gave us this regular classes on Bhagavatam. Study Bhagavatam, study these topics. And it's a, a whole life we can... If we only study Bhagavatam, we can go a whole life, just again and again and again, reading. And then to deepen our studies, we can also uh, read corollary works written by Acharyas, especially the Shachandharva of Jiva Goswami is meant for uh, its exposition of, of Bhagavad philosophy. So we can spend our, of course, there are so many things to do. Otherwise, uh, uh, there are so many. Also, we have to serve the mission of Bhagavatam by preaching the message of these books. And, and in the Bhagavatam itself, Nama Sankirtana Vyasya ends with the, with the admonition to chant the names of Krishna. So that we should also do. The whole process of Bhakti Yoga is given. But this hearing Bhagavatam to understand what is the nature of God, uh, why we should surrender to Him, how, how we can develop our forgotten love for Him, all these topics that are in Bhagavatam. So you have to understand very carefully this long purpose, this, you know, five, more than five pages. But that's just, you know, more than five page purpose, but that's just touching what is this subject matter. You have a question? I'll read the text, okay. Asti yagya patir nama keshanchid arha sattamaha iha mutra chalakshante jyodsnavatya kvachit bhuvaha. My dear respectable ladies and gentlemen, according to the authoritative statements of Shastra, there must be a supreme authority who is able to award the respective benefits of our present activities. Otherwise, why should there be persons who are unusually beautiful and powerful both in this life and in the life after death? So you'd like to make any proposition or ask any question based on that? No, I just want to mention that uh, from a Catholic theology hmm. they also, their idea is also that animals have souls but in Catholic animals, theology, they gave them souls after 2,000 years. Oh. That's a new, new theological development. Hmm. That's accepted by the... That's given... It's got the papal bull. That's... Really? Well, whatever the Pope says is infallible, so... Of course, all the other popes previous to him didn't accept that. So, the soul disintegrates. It means it, it's again. It's like talking talking about God without knowledge. The soul doesn't disintegrate, so they don't know what soul is. What they call soul, it, it, it's not uh, not actually the proper understanding of the soul. Therefore, it's very important to define words very clearly. What we mean when we're talking. Of, just like we, we may have some interfaith discussion, they're talking about God and we're talking about God, but, but what is their understanding? First we should understand what we mean by this. Similarly, we're talking in Mayavadis, they, they, they'll talk Atma and we'll talk Atma, but their understanding, we may use the same word, but their understanding is quite different. So our discussion, it's that there's that saying, one is talking about apples and the other is talking about oranges. It's, so Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he was... Uh, He was one of the important points of his preaching. He wanted to make a big uh, dictionary or defining, clearly defining what is the meaning of words. Otherwise, he says, by misuse, then the proper understanding will be lost. And he gave so many examples, the meaning of, of Bhagavan, the meaning of Dharma, the meaning of Bhakti, the meaning of Seva, so many different words which are being mis because of misuse based on misconceptions. And therefore, uh, just by misuse of these words, people might presume themselves to be religious, but they're actually going in the wrong direction altogether. So definition of words is very important. This, uh, George Orwell noted this on the, on the mundane platform, how by 
manipulation of language. One, one can manipulate thought. That also Ravindra Sruprabhu in that, in that, what was the name of that Bhakti Godhead article? Abortion and the language of unconsciousness. So, abortion becomes, what is it? Pregnancy, pregnancy termination or something? Tissue. tissue removal. Euphemisms, yeah. Family planning. <laughs> family planning, yeah. Just that, that term. We have a lot of family medical centers around here. Family means. Uh, Make sure there is no family. <laughs> Murdering your children. Family planning. They make such a fuss if someone kills a child once it's out of the womb. They, they become so... They think this is really terrible, but they, 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 they take it as normal and proper to do so. You should do so. In many cases, they say, you should. Don't have too many choices. Proper to do so. If they kill before, it comes from the womb. So this, uh, this euphemistic use of language, is, it's, it's clearly just hypocrisy and politically motivated to, uh, to achieve an aim which is, which is clearly not good, but you, you try to change the perception of it by using euphemistic language. <laughs> yeah, who, who is you going to say? Um, I'm just going to ask uh, about how you're talking about uh, people who are scientifically minded. Uh, so many people these days. Are so people who are what, sorry? Scientifically minded. Scientifically minded. Well, there may not be that many, actually. Most people don't give a damn about science. They're more interested in what hamburgers and football games and Sleeping and uh, sex and all this kind of thing, but uh, but the, the 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 intellectual life of the world is is which dominates the educational systems and the, the thought processes of those few people who think is dominated by this atheistic approach to science. Yeah, so it is important. It, it is important to to rebut their fallacies. Yeah. In talking to them, you try to establish any sort of conception of anything beyond what they can experience simply mm. with their gross material senses. It seems like it's been conditioned for so long that everything they have, they have to experience everything through their gross material senses. Well, that that I say is the first foolishness of the empiric method. If we say that. We can only accept as reality that which, we, that which is experienceable. Uh, that in itself is foolish. Why should it be that every, everything in reality is uh, within the purview of our senses, within the purview of our sensual perception? It would rather be much more reasonable to, to suppose that there, is, there, are, there are so many things going on which we have no... Uh, way to directly perceive through our senses. That would, be, that would be much more reasonable, wouldn't it? And they themselves, uh, actually they, this, this idea that, that, that we can only accept that which is empirically verifiable, uh, that actually that was, that's like uh, more than 70 years ago, that was all thrown out by, by the beginnings of quantum theory. <laughs> but, but at street level, people think that science, or people think that science means uh, that which gives us knowledge, certain knowledge of this material world. But, uh, but uh, among physicists themselves, uh, they're <laughs> Within the last 20 years or so, some French scientists brought some new theory, and it was so bizarre that uh, other 
another physicist was, was asked to comment on it and he said, we're not sure whether it's a joke or whether they mean it because it's so absurd. But then everything in physics these days is absurd. So it's not that much difference from, from anything else in that respect. Because they got lost in, 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 in their theorizing on, on the nature of the nature of matter. Because subatomic particles, they don't. They, they, science means they should give laws which govern matter in all times, places, and circumstances. But they, but they find that they can't do it. That that. Uh, they, they just can't do it. That, so, so they, they then they come to un, they talk as if they know everything with certainty. But then they, they have Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, or, or, which that uh, sometimes what are considered to be subatomic particles, if they appear to act like particles, and, and other times they appear to act like waves. So you're not really sure what it is. And if you if you try to examine it as a particle. Uh, then certain rules, then certain things, you, you can't fully define it because it, it only acts as a particle in some ways and, but if you try to define it as a wave, that also doesn't fit. And then you get Schrodinger's imaginary cat which uh, according to quantum theory is simultaneously 100% alive and 100% dead. And all kinds of, you know, this is all... This was in the 1930s, and they've been going on since, and they still they haven't come to any. They're just in their attempts to sort this stuff out. It just gets more and more absurd. So again, that Dave Amrit Maharaj, he, he surprised the atomic physicists by saying they don't know what they're talking about, and she was surprised by saying, "How does he know?" There's one statement in the Quran that says, even if we gave, uh, Muhammad speaking, says, even if we gave evidence to people, they wouldn't believe it. And that's one thing is that there's even so many evidences, you know, we can present them with that are... It's, I, I, that I forgot to say in the lecture, it's obvious. Yeah, to, you know, to the... It's just like, where's, where's this? Okay, there's the, there's the standard thing I do. Okay, what is this? Well, in America, you don't see it often. In India, it's called a steel glass which is a kind of oxymoron, because glass is supposed to be made out of glass. Anyway, a tumbler, I guess we could call it a tumbler, right? It's a steel tumbler. Okay, so uh, this steel tumbler, uh, what happened one day, there was a, a minor explosion in my cabbage patch, and then uh, it, it went on exploding for some time, and then uh, when it ended, I found that by chance, this had come into being. Okay, that's reasonable, right? No one would accept such a foolish proposition that by chance, with some, some chance explosion in my cabbage patch, this steel tumbler came into existence. If we think, I, we, we could write encyclopedias about this, about how it was first of all d discovered how you could make steel and then different qualities of steel and how to find the iron ore, and then how to mine it, which mines are economically viable, and then how to smelt it, and how to extract it, and how to smelt it, and how to make this kind, how to shape it in such a way that it doesn't leak, and it's just, it's just the right strength, so when you pick it up, it doesn't cr get crushed, and then it's not too heavy, it's just, just right, and, and to fit this on just right, that, so it just fits on nicely. It's not too tight that... Uh, you can't take it off. And it's not so loose that when you, that when you, it just falls off when you put it in. Your, just very nicely made. A lot of, so much human intelligence and endeavor went into making this thing, which is, so just nicely, you, you put water in it and you drink it. And, and then there's the whole proposition that the businessman who m made this, first of all, he considered, is it going to be a profitable business? And then how to market it and what price he should sell it for and then how to distribute it to, for, to to wholesale it to different retailers and like that. You can write dozens of books just about this. Because so behind the fact that I am sitting here holding this, 
which we can accept as a fact. Without, as a, we don't need a scientific inquiry into that. But uh, we can accept as if there's so much human endeavor and intelligence has gone just into this thing, into the fact that I'm sitting here holding this. So if we say that the whole universe is coming to chance, it's, it's, it's absurd, it's totally bizarre, ridiculous. Even if you have millions of scientific formulae to supposedly uphold, but of course they don't. They don't know. They only theorize. So, it's, it's not a difficult thing to understand that there is God, but, but because they're determined to the, at least that there is a creator of this universe. This universe is not coming to being by chance. If we accept, at least that we can accept this. It, it's, God, of course, is much more than, a, than the cosmic creator. But at least, at least that much we should accept there is God. And it's not at all reasonable to presume that there isn't God. It's totally unreasonable and unscientific not to accept. And if we say we want a scientific theory which, ex which brings all the other theories together, which they say, unified theory of everything, that's it, that there's God and he, he, he brings it all together. But that they want. They want it in mathematics. But you'll find that all the scientific theories fit within this, that everything is under the control and direction of a supreme creator and authority. Best scientific theory. But they're such rascals, they won't accept. So Actually, I interrupted your question, right? You answered it. Okay. But the only other thing I was going to say is, well, even there's so many, you know, super phenomenal, you know, instances that occur, but then they try to explain them all the way. That is, if they were... Explain them away or ignore them. Yeah. Uh, another thing in, in physics, they have, they have discovered that there are, are pairs of particles. They discovered this decades ago. That one may be in one location, another may be in a location thousands of miles away. And if one moves one way, the other will move, exactly at the same moment, the other will move the other way. And how physicists have explained this, they haven't. They just forgot about it, kind of. You know, they just, they haven't even, after decades, they haven't even begun to attempt to try to explain it. <laughs> so that's, that's one way. As this forbidden archaeology they showed, in the, how in the field of archaeology and geology, that uh, scientists uphold their theories by burying the... This is, this is good archaeology. <laughs> Archaeologists are supposed to dig things up, but if they dig something up that doesn't fit with their theory, then they bury it all again. <laughs> well, they either bury it or ignore it. I, I mentioned that to someone at work, and I was with them about evolution, and he looked surprised and said, how do you know that? Like as if it was a conspiracy. He said, someone, you know, they wrote a this book and said, I didn't think anyone else knew this except pretty much me. So no. <laughs> Why, he's a geologist or what? No, he, he's just a kind of eccentric hmm. man that knows a lot of information. But when I was arguing with him and I said this, he was surprised. He, he thought, you know, he apparently thought that he, there was only a very few people, elite people in the country, that, that knew that what these scientists were doing of hiding the information. <laughs> no, there are websites and everything now. Yeah. But still, you know, most people they're interested in, in like that, baseball and boozing and eh, what do they care? The world goes on. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, Prabhupada gave that. We have to distribute these books and then the BI has to, has to expose the cheating of the scientists, all these important things we have to do. So much important work. It's not a Child's play, as Prabhupada said. Hare Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. His divine grace, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Holiness Prabhupada Kashwar. Jai.